Hi, I'm Colin Klupik, and welcome to this video series where we talk to Dr. Martha Burns about the latest from the field of neuroscience and what it has to say about learning. In this discussion, we take a look at some of the latest thinking on the subject of autism. That's a wonderful question. Um, the term autism spectrum disorders is now used because we recognize that autism isn't a unitary problem, that there are lots of different components. It's very heterogeneous. Uh, and there's quite a bit of research going on all over the world now uh, to look for markers of autism very early, to start looking to see if we can identify children who might be at risk for autism spectrum disorders at six months or seven months, and then to help parents and interventionists um, work with the children so you can guide the children so that their brain develops more typically and it doesn't develop in an unusual way because it looks as though autism spectrum disorders are a brain that's developing in a very different way. Um, we have long fiber tracks in the brain and we have kind of short fiber tracks. And the newest research, there's new research just published by WAS and in another great article, research published by Anderson and colleagues, showing that, that autism, seem, autism spectrum disorders seem to be problems where the brain is not making the superhighways and the connections, um, and those aren't developing the way they would in a typical child. And it looks like we can drive that development in young children, or if we can find the children and identify them soon enough, we can drive the brain to develop in a more typical way by the way we stimulate a child. But it will have to be intensive, and we'll need parents to understand some of the um, ways to, to talk to their children and play with their children, to get their children's brain to develop in a more typical fashion. Um, then once a child is two or three and identified, we do have some excellent therapies that have been emerging over the past several years. They include applied behavioral analysis, but they also include um, something called floor time or DIR, which is a interactive approach where you play with the child and you get into the child's world and through interaction you bring the child out. And then we have other approaches. There's one called relationship development intervention for parents that's all based on building up um, play routines with a child so that they can interact with other people more uh, more typically. So there's a lot on the horizon. Uh, there's a lot that we already know about autism and I would say summarize it by saying more is better. <laughs> so the more we intervene with these children and the sooner and the more we can play with them and talk with them the better we're going to drive their brain to develop into a typical functioning brain. Yes, well, what some of the researchers are looking at, there's a great study going on at U University of California, Davis, for example. They're looking at um, whether the child is able to establish eye contact with, their, with a parent. They're looking at something called mutual gaze, where if, if, uh, if I look at something, will the baby follow my gaze and look at what I'm looking at? They're also looking at babbling. Is the baby babbling and making noises and trying to communicate when it's young through sound play? Um, they also are looking at the baby's uh, seven months old's um, tolerance for being held and interacting with other people. And then one interesting area that's, that's emerging is the child's interest in movement, in biological movement and in facial expression. So those are early markers they're starting to be able to pick up in a very young child who looks like they're developing very typically but might just start to be showing some signs that could suggest the child might be moving a little bit more toward an autistic spectrum kind of disorder. Most of the research now is centering on three areas. Um, there's a worldwide autism genome project where where centers around the world, there are several in Australia, there are several in the United States, Europe, are looking at families that have a child, have more than one child or one, more than one individual in the, in the um, nuclear family that has autism spectrum disorders and looking at their genetic profile. And the Autism Genome Project as of now have identified about a hundred genes that in different combinations seem to predispose a child to an autism spectrum disorder. 
Then in addition to genetics, there's also um, research in what we call epigenetics. And those are environmental factors and um, factors of nutrition that may turn genes on and off. Epigenetics just means above the genome. So if you think of the gene as the hardware of your body, at the epigenome is the software that makes the hardware run. So what you eat, the environmental influences, toxins in the environment can all affect your genes and can turn genes on that you don't want turned on and sometimes turn genes off that you do want turned on. So there's a lot of research in environmental agents and factors like that that may be contributing to autism spectrum disorder. And then the last is just looking at um, interventions and the way that we interact with young children and factors in their world like having a lot of computers might actually bias the brain toward functioning more toward technology and less toward people, for example. So are there environmental factors that we can change that favor interaction with people that help children develop language and, and that could override some of the genetic predispositions.